Hey, everybody. We have some people just a little bit more time to join. Um, I don't know. Let me get my stuff pulled up. Make sure I have volume up in case you guys talk to me. Oh, that's true. Probably, I say that I'll wait till five after, but I'm probably not going to because you guys know I'm impatient. this real quick. I'm going to do something. Let's see. We've got six people on here.
Sorry, guys. I guess we waited five minutes after all. All right, let's do this. It is so quiet in here. I feel like there should be music playing or something. <laughs> okay. I'm going to be sure that I click on the pen before I try to write with it and get frustrated. All right. Exam three, just to reiterate for you guys, um, exam three is only going to be chapters 11 and 12, and then 15 through 18. It won't be over any of the previous chapters, and it's only going to be covering the information that is on those review slides. And what I mean my review slides, not this review, of course, I'm talking about do -do 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 -do, like these. It didn't, I'm sorry, I ran into a thing. These things. So you, you guys have seen these before. Um, but yeah, this is all the information that you should need. Of course, some of these, okay, it's big now. Um, some of them might have like, and I've said it a million times, I just want to say it one more. If it has a word, especially if it's in bold, but any word might count. Um, and it doesn't have like a direct explanation or definition of that word on there. And it's not one that just you use in daily life. Uh, you should probably know that word. Like you should at least understand it. So um, just FYI, because I'm not just going to put um, that sort of like direct this word. What was, did this word have a definition on this, on the slide? Yes or no. <laughs> so it's not going to be that. Um, so yeah, if the word is on there, you would have to understand that word. Um, but it shouldn't be anything really beyond that. Because I literally wrote the questions from these slides and the information that is actually on these slides. Um, I didn't go outside of that. So you should have that, should be well prepared. That's basically your study sheet. I keep clicking on it to go away and I'm not meaning to. All right, so let's do this. My mouse. All right, so first we're gonna get into chapter 11. Chapter 11 covers physical and chemical methods of microbial control. Um, and what does that mean by microbial control? You know preventing microbes from growing or killing the microbes, right? So this is like, not this one doesn't include antibiotics. That was chapter 11. Uh, so this is like surfaces and things like that. So the first question that I am posing towards you guys, um, chapter 11, question one, blank is the term referring to the removal of microbes from a living surface while blank is the equivalent for non-living surfaces. And again, I'm just gonna give like a pause here. So if you guys want to look through your notes or try to answer it yourselves, you can. If you've been studying and you think you're you know, getting pretty good uh, where you are with your studying, then you should be able to probably answer some of these on your own. So should we give that a little bit under this crappy soda. All right. So removal of microbes from a living surface versus a non-living surface is basically what we're talking about here. So here we have a sepsis is uh, referring to removing microbes from a living surface. This is super annoying. And then disinfection is the same thing for a non-living surface. Um, and then we have some notes that you guys can um, access that are on like, the, for me, they're on my sidebar when I am presenting but I don't know how um, you guys look at them on, like you can print them out and they'll print out like literally under each slide. But we also have other choices on here, right? We have decontamination and sterilization. 
decontamination would be the mechanical removal of microbes. Just anytime that you're like scrubbing them off or something like that, and you're not like using chemicals um, and other methods, that is uh, decontamination. And um, then we have sterilization, the other term that's on this, that would be removal of all microbial life. And um, that would include endospores. And remember, the most difficult thing to remove will be prions, not endospores. Prions are more difficult to remove than the endospores because they're just protein. So you don't have to kill them. You have to completely denature the protein. So it takes a little bit more work. So you can do that by treating with sodium hydroxide. And if you don't know that, that's a, a very, very strong um, base. It's alkaline. Um, and then autoclaving at 135 degrees Celsius. Now, um, you were like, okay, cool, 135. The other ones are 121. So it is special. It does get its own thing. So if you suspected that you had come into contact with that, you might want to sterilize your instruments like a little bit more hardcore if you had a prion. Prions are not alive. So be careful when you read questions on the test. If it just says pathogen, that doesn't indicate living or not or anything. So that pathogen is a term that could include a prion. If I ask the question about living microbes, <laughs> that doesn't include prions. So that would be endospores, probably be your answer for that one, just so you guys know when we encounter that. Um, yes, I have a lot of stuff going on here. Maybe I can put this. I'm scooting things across your window, sorry. All right, number two, blank is the term referring to stopping the growth of microbes without killing them, while blank is the term for killing the microbes. So this, these are terms that, of course, we saw these in lab. So I'm not going to give you too long to look at these because these ones should be popping up pretty readily in your mind by now. It's something that we encounter and talk about actually uh, pretty frequently. So for um, stopping the growth or inhibiting the growth, that's going to be static. And then for killing, that's going to be cidal. So microbicidal and microbostatic in this case. Germicidal and germostatic, those words are interchangeable with the microba, just FYI. All right. Then we have, okay, let's see, because it's going to make these pop up. If I click on the right window, it'll make these pop up. There we go. Okay, so then we have pasteurization on here. Um, pasteurization, we know that that, well, most of us should know by now that that is um, not going to be sterilizing, right? We know it involves moist heat, but it is a moist heat method that uh, does not involve, involve sterilization. It'll just get rid of like the pathogens that we would be concerned about. Um, but yeah, because like imagine like if you had something that was a sterile liquid that you were going to be storing somewhere, you wouldn't need to refrigerate it and it wouldn't go bad like in like three days in the refrigerator. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, sterile things, I mean, we keep those on the shelf for like years. So, um, so yeah, that's how you know they're, that that's not sterile. We know we pasteurize our milk. So that's one way you can kind of work backwards from that if you're not sure. Um, yeah, and then we have degermination. Um, that's basically the same thing as uh, a asepsis. Degermination is the removal of microbes from a living surface. It's just that's one I'm I'm not going to test you about degermination. You're welcome. Now I need to know asepsis. <laughs> All right. Question three. Oh, was there anything else I wanted? I think that was it. Question three, um, list two specific physical methods of microbial control that can sterilize when you use them properly. So there's a whole lot. Well, there's several anyways. There's quite a lot. We'll let you guys think about it for just a second. Okay, so let's go through these. Here are some correct options that your two answers may have come from. If your two answers are not on this list and you want to, uh, you're not sure if they um, could still qualify, you can always ask me and then we'll talk about them. 
but these are the ones, um, these should be all the ones that we have in the list for the slide, I'm just saying, that would fall into this. Okay, we have uh, incineration. So incineration here, we are using dry heat. Good, that's what I wanted to have happen. I'm just literally trying to just scroll. And this is not, it doesn't work well since when I have like a thousand windows open, I'm sorry. Okay, dry heat. Um, incineration, dry heat. Dry oven, dry heat. There are other versions of dry heat, obviously, that won't sterilize, but these two will if you get the temperature high enough and you expose the thing long enough. You have to go for a longer time at a much higher temperature when you're looking at the dry heat versus the moist heat ones. But these are the dry heat ones um, that would sterilize. Next, we have um, the moist heat ones. Here I have the autoclave. And that's typically like the A number one that you guys would want to probably be familiar with as far as the moist heat way to sterilize something. We like never talked about tindalization. It's a thing that exists and it does sterilize and it will not be on the test. So, but it does exist. So I don't wanna lead you astray or something. And it is on the slide. So I don't wanna lead you astray or something. Tindalization just involves boiling for like 15 minutes and then waiting for a day, boiling for 15 minutes and then waiting for a day and then boiling for 15 minutes. <laughs> So it's kind of a weird thing that they discovered worked like really like a long, long time ago. And they named it after this guy, probably his last name was Tyndall, I'm guessing, right? So uh, it does sterilize. And even though we're only boiling and we all know boiling, we should know, FYI, boiling does not sterilize. So how did they get boiling to sterilize? Well, imagine this, we have all this mixture of microbes um, like in your pot, right? all different kinds, including endospores. And you boil it. Pretty much everything's going to die except the endospores, right? That's the whole problem with the boiling. Um, then you let it, let it sit. What's happening during the sitting period is those endospores are uh, germinating, right? Turning back into vegetative cells because it's just them sitting there and things have gotten friendly again. So they're gonna germinate and turn back to normal cells. So you boil it again. And any of them that you missed the first round, you'll get the second round. And it actually does end up working that way. <laughs> it was crazy. It was so crazy that they even like found this out, I think. But I, the only reason I tell the story is I think it's particularly interesting as far as the science goes behind it with the endospores. It really puts into perspective the problem of the endospores, right? But anyways. So those are the moist heat methods that can sterilize. Next, we have the radiation ones. The ones we have um, radiation, we had two kinds of radiation that we talked about, ionizing and non-ionizing, right? Ionizing radiation, we have these crazy energetic waves that are flying through um, the molecules of like your cells or the bacteria cells, and they are causing all this damage they are literally ejecting electrons off of your molecules. Now we already know if you have sodium chloride salt, right? And we were putting it into water because it has an ionic bond, we get sodium and chloride. The sodium donated an electron to chlorine, so it's negative. And now the sodium's positive, right? That's the ionic bond that generates ions, right? That's supposed to happen there. You have this energy forcing electrons out. The electrons are still gone, just like they would be in an ionic bond, but they're not going to like an accepting molecule and everybody's happy at the end. They didn't want to go. They got pushed right out of there by a gamma ray or something. So, um, so yeah, so then that generates ions in your body that are like part of your, like your DNA and your actual cell and like any molecule in your body can have that happen to it. So no surprise that if you go sit your butt down in the middle of ground zero of Chernobyl right now, you're going to come home. You'll have burns on you and stuff like that, not because of heat, but because of these gamma rays and so many of them so strongly going through your tissue in your body. And over time, um, those damaged cells 
can lead to uh, cancer because they're not getting repaired properly because they don't have a freaking electron. So you get it. That's why ionizing radiation is so harmful and dangerous. Um, but yeah, so non-ionizing radiation is the other one. So we only have two kinds, yeah? Non-ionizing radiation, um, that's UV radiation, ultraviolet. And yeah, if you guys go like uh, search for is UV radiation, can it sterilize? It'll say yes. But if you go specifically to backed actual scientific <laughs> sites, it will tell you it does not sterilize. It like gets like 99.99%. You might be like, that's sterilizing, but it's not right. All it takes is one. Yeah. So we don't consider that sterilizing. They can market it to you as sterilizing. UV radiation though, technically isn't sterilizing. It can be good enough for whatever you're doing, but we don't call it sterilizing for our purposes. Um, I hope that makes sense. Cause I know there was some confusion with ultraviolet radiation. I think there is, should be no doubt in anybody's mind that when you put ultraviolet radiation, which is from like from the sun too. Yeah. We go out in that all the time and it shouldn't be particularly when you go out in it all the time. <laughs> so, um, but do you go out all the time in the same concentration of gamma rays of x-rays and of cathode rays that we see with the ionizing versions? Uh, uh, because you'd die, you'd be dead if you did it. So that's, they're a lot stronger. Just think of it that way. That's not why you're, you know, not getting exposed to them all the time and getting hearing about the damage that they would cause and be aware of them or something like that, because we're just assuming this is the radiation that they have the suits and the Geiger counters with. That's what we're talking about here. This is the most dangerous of all the radiations that ever exist as far as we're concerned. So um, this is as bad as it gets, the ionizing guys. UV looks like a baby compared to that. And we should see it that way, specifically because, I mean, we walk around in it all the time. Our bodies have adapted to it and they're able to adapt to it. Not many things are going to be able to adapt to the other kinds of radiation. So we have repair mechanisms that can handle ultraviolet radiation. So do other organisms, including the microbes. And that's the problem with why we can't necessarily say that it's sterilizing. So, but yeah, I hope that makes sense with the differences between those. Um, I'm just trying to see if I missed anything. I don't think I did. When we go back to the dry heat, I told you that incineration and dry ovens work really well to sterilize things. We don't have a direct example on the slide, I don't think, of, um, I can look at it, it's freaking right here. I could have just looked at it, but um, sorry, I'm, I'm looking at it. Oh no, it doesn't really say it directly, but the dry heat methods. So, um, it's the same idea with the incineration and the dry oven. The dry oven's just doing it for a longer period of time so you don't have flames necessarily involved in it. But um, everything else that is dry heat, the whole idea is you have to, that's where that thermal death point and the thermal death time come into play. So if we're talking about a temperature that you want to treat it at, let's say at the temperature you would use it in that dry oven. If you're using it at that specific temperature, you need to know how long it has to go at that temperature in order to kill everything. That's the thermal death time. However, if you only have 20 minutes to sterilize your thing, at what temperature do you have to put that dry oven at in order to sterilize in 20 minutes? I mean, that would be a freaking miracle. You probably have to have it. It's not a dry oven anymore. It's more like a crematorium. But um, you guys get the idea, yes? So anything that can't meet those qualifications, either due to physics or just the fact that you can't establish that thing maybe at home or you can't put everything in a fire, um, anything else would fall into um, not being able to sterilize on that dry heat side. So just warming your thing, um, like having a warm soup. You put something in your on your stove to warm up your soup. That's not sterilizing your soup. That's heat. And of course that is moist. So that's maybe not a good example, but you could put a piece of toast on there. That's a great example, actually. So it's not going to sterilize your toast to put it in a toaster oven. Um, you'd have to burn it like completely through in order for everything to be killed there. So that's, you know, 
for everyday stuff, everyday temperatures aren't usually going to do it unless it's fire. Mm -mm. I would be aware that boiling, which I already mentioned with the moist heat, doesn't sterilize because it doesn't kill the endospores. That's the reason. It doesn't have to be any fancier than that. And that neither does that pasteurization. I know I already brought it up, but just remember. And I would recommend, if you can, um, creating a chart where you divide it up um, from like your knowledge or even from these slides, make something similar to what that book has of like what this is the physical means and these are the chemical means and you know this is dry and this is moist heat and this is radiation and then which one sterilize and which one doesn't and all that. And just write it out for your own purposes so you can see it and understand it, how they relate a little bit better. I think that's a great idea for this. Um, anyways, let's move on to the next thing. Okay, this is our question number four. It has um, choices here. So <laughs> you can choose from these. List two <laughs> chemical methods um, of microbial control that can sterilize when used properly at the appropriate concentrations. So I didn't, I forgot to do the click on this one. That was my bad, but these are your answers. <laughs> these are the answers that you could choose from. You could, if, I'm not going to ask you to list these, right? You'll have a multiple choice, but you guys can know now, these are the chemical ones that sterilize. We have the halogens. The halogens, if you remember, it's the enes and the eins, iodine, chlorine, um, fluorine, or fluoride, even in your toothpaste and stuff like that. Um, those things, those things are the things that are going to be. Um, <clears throat> I should just drink, drink this nasty soda. Hold on, my throat skin is so dry. It's not good. Okay, what was I even talking about? The halogens, chlorines are going to include bleach. The iodines, we already know that that can include the stuff that we use for prep on skin. You don't have to know what it's called, but just so that you remember that it's a thing. Um, and then the enes and the ions in general will fall into this group, okay? They have the ability to sterilize if they are used correctly at the appropriate concentrations to achieve it. They aren't always going to. In general, like if you're going to be like maybe putting some bleach in some water to mop your floors, it, it probably is going to be watered down more than it could to sterilize your floors, right? Well, it's fine. You're not trying to sterilize. You're trying to make sure it's clean enough. Um, but that's fine. So it's certain concentrations. All right. The next one are the oxidizing agents. So we really only have four kind of groups that will qualify. And these are the examples for them. So halogens, chlorines, and the iodines. Oxidizing agents. That includes hydrogen peroxide. We already know hydrogen peroxide is an oxidizing agent. We talked about that way back when, when we were learning about toxic oxygen byproducts. Same thing here. We're just using that to our advantage now in order for um, us to accomplish killing things. <laughs> you get it enough of a concentration or like, um, you know, put it in, nebulize it into the air and it can be used to sterilize things as well. The aldehydes are the third kind of group. Um, this is going to be glutaraldehyde and formaldehyde. Um, glutaraldehyde and formaldehyde can sterilize. Typically call, talk about more with the glutaraldehyde because formaldehyde tends to be so toxic. But um, OPA, and I don't ask me, don't ask me to say the word. I don't even know how to pronounce it. But um, the OPA, which is an aldehyde a kind of derivative that is much safer, but it cannot sterilize. It's safer can't sterilize. So not that useful in the end if you need to sterilize something. But those good old buddies, glutaraldehyde and formaldehyde, you can count on those guys. Then we have the gases. So um, ethylene oxide, and you can create a chemiclave with that. Just fill a whole room with that gas and the things in it will get sterilized by that. And it's very irritating and toxic. <laughs> so you don't want to be involved with that if you're a person. And then we have chlorine dioxide gas, which, you know, it's not super like human life friendly, but at the same time, um, 
that's better than the straight up chlorine gas that we might use for like treating our water or something. So um, let's see, let's see, let's go through the guys. So remember that sterilizing means um, killing the endospores and the resistant bacteria. Um, and one of the more resistant bacteria that I did want to bring up and that I wrote in the little notes was the tubercle bacillus. So here we're talking about um, mycobacterium tuberculosis. That's what that is. And it's very resistant because it has that waxy layer. Remember that waxy layer is made up of something called, well, it has in it, mycolic acid, that mycolic acid that gives it its name. And that is what is reacting with your carbol fusion when you're staining it in the acid bast stain. Let's bring it all home, right? <laughs> so, um, but yeah, they're very resistant because of that waxy covering. And it's so, it's kind of important that if you are concerned that um, there might be a presence of tuberculosis in whatever area you're cleaning at the hospital in a bedroom where you're caring for a loved one or something like that, uh, that you take that into consideration when choosing a cleaning product, make sure that it can kill that very resistant microbe that is not gonna be producing endospores, but is still very resistant. So anyways, um, so yeah, sterilizing means to kill everything. Alcohols do not do that effectively. They can work in a variety of ways, actually. And you might even have noticed it during your studying that sometimes it says that it's for, you know, helping with just mechanical removal of microbes. Sometimes it says that it will dry, dry out the area. Sometimes it says it helps break down the cell walls. And then other times it'll say that it helps to denature proteins um, and does all of those things. And you'd think that that would mean that it could sterilize, but even at 70%, which is the ideal concentration, you're not going to achieve sterilization with it. But it's great for antisepsis because it's not particularly toxic as far as you know putting on um, human skin or something like that. Uh, so yeah, disinfection, it's also great. It's also affordable. Anyways, um, the other one that we had talked about in that chapter were, were the phenols and the phenolics, which are derivatives of phenol. Phenol is, um, it was used originally uh, to sterilize, you know, the, the very first sterilization um, chemical to, to treat surgical suites whenever they were performing surgery. And it led to a very great reduction in, in infection of the patients. But that's great, but it's not going to be effective for actual sterilization as far as we have learned that to mean. So it's also really toxic and it's really bad. You can't put it on, you can't use it as a um, asept, like for the antiseptics, like we put asepsis, you know, that term, um, on skin is toxic just to fumes are bad and yeah, phenol, not that great, but we also have the phenolics that includes triclosan, which was that, um, chemical slash antibiotic that I was talking to you guys about was overused for a very, very long time, um, during our lifetime. Um, and that had to be like rethought about everything. And then also includes um, chlorhexidine and chlorhexidine being a very important chemical that we use now in healthcare for, um, you know, pre prepping sites for, you know, central lines or um, IVs or um, blood donation. Or, and it's also a chemical that we find in hibiclens, um, which we might use to you know, scrub to get um, into sterilization, you know, operating rooms and stuff like that. Just in general scrubs, you hear about um, surgeons scrubbing, that's that's the soap they might use. These do not, they don't sterilize. The phenolics are gonna be way less toxic. They don't sterilize, but they help achieve what they are um, trying to achieve. And if you combine them with other chemicals and, and other cleaning methods like scrubbing or um, you know, including other, like the, uh, what is the word? Surfactants, detergents, that can help the chlorhexidine do its job better then you might be able to achieve sterilization that way. So you can always combine these things, but in and of itself, any of the phenols aren't gonna do it. Um, and we've talked about, like I just said, the surfactants, they're gonna mimic our membranes, um, at least the molecules that make up our membranes. Remember we have that polar phosphate group head and then the hydrophobic tails that don't like water. And they make that bilayer of our membranes. Well, the surfactant molecules are very similar shape, and they just kind of squeeze in there 
and it helps open up our membranes. And now we're losing what's inside and now things that are outside can get in better, like the chlorhexidine. So that's why it's good to pair it with other things if you can. If you guys have heard of quaternary ammonia compounds or quats, these qualify in this arena. That's it um, for that chapter. No, yes, yeah. I'm gonna go. Oh, I have to click through the colors. Yay. All right, yeah, that is. Okay, chapter 12. Now that is the antimicrobial chemotherapeutic drugs. Like uh, antibiotics, which is what, what it focuses on the most. So our first question for this chapter is, what part of the bacterial cell does penicillin affect? I have a lot of people who get this one wrong. So we are going to talk about it a little bit to be sure that we could get the correct answer when we're on the test, hopefully. But penicillin and the other beta-lactam drugs, the cillins in general, um, and the cephalosporins, they are going to affect the cell wall. Those are all beta-lactams. The beta-lactams, um, I mean, there's a whole, whole lot that fall into that group. And this one, I like it because... The psyllins are the psyllins, man. And I've told you guys when we have like the protein affecting antibiotics and we talk about the mycins, I'm like, oh yes, yeah, yeah, you know, gentamicin and streptomycin and all these. Yeah, they're the protein, they're gonna affect protein production. But then there's another mycin that does not fall into that category, vancomycin. Vancomycin falls into this category, the cell wall category. So um, this, the psyllins, they don't have any migrators like that. <laughs> But the cell wall um, drugs, they have some that have migrated in from other categories. So I would be aware of that, but like vancomycin for sure, because you guys are going to be using that in, you know, whenever you get into healthcare. So remember that one, um, it's going to be geared more towards affecting the cell wall, just like penicillin does. Mm -mm -mm. It does not have a beta lactam ring though, just FYI works differently. All right. Nope. I wasn't done with that. I just want to be sure I don't leave anybody out. No, I didn't. So cell wall affecting antibiotics too. I did want to mention, cause this was a question in the lab. And I think the concept is important. Um, gram positive bacteria have a thick cell wall. So our inclination might be that, Oh, they have a thicker cell wall. So they're more protected from the effects of the like penicillin or cell wall affecting um, antibiotics, but that's not true because they have that big thick cell wall. They need that big thick thick cell wall. So having something break that down or prevent it from being generated, which is usually a lot of times how that's going to work, um, it makes it so that their cells can't function the way that it needs to in the presence of things like salt and stuff like that. Because that cell wall helps them maintain their shape so that they don't burst and, and uh, protects with other aspects of the cell too. But but yeah, so it's going to affect them more. Whereas the gram negatives, I mean, they affect them, but they're just like, eh. <laughs> so they're going to work way better typically on gram positives. Can you use them to treat gram negative infections? You can, yeah. Okay, list an example of an antibiotic that affects protein synthesis. It kind of already gave you this one away. So that's okay. Um, <laughs> that's all right. Yeah, the mycins, right? I said it already. The, that group, the mycins, that's the aminoglycosides. That's basically just the type of chemical shape that those would fall under. Those mycins will include things like neomycin, which is found in neosporin. Obviously, that's why it's called that. Tobramycin, and gentamicin, streptomycin, and a lot of them fall into this category. These are the aminoglycosides. They do affect protein synthesis. And how do they affect protein synthesis? By affecting the way that the ribosome is able to function. So they just block that. Um, so that's that, but that's not all of them. The next ones that I don't want you guys to forget about are the uh, tetracycline and glycylcycline, but we talked the most about tetracycline. 
Um, so don't forget about that one. It is a, an extremely broad range antibiotic. So if you had somebody who had an illness, or you weren't sure, um, you know, if your medication could treat it or not, and you're waiting on some results, this is one of those options that you would try to use for like a blanket treatment without having to give them multiple, multiple, multiple antibiotics to achieve that. Um, but yeah, and you can use it by itself to treat specific infections as well, just depending on your pathogen, right? Okay. Question three, which of these works by affecting the nucleic acid synthesis? So this is sort of a multiple choice. This is the type of thing that you will be seeing on the exam. This is it's like a almost exact, it might, it might be the same question. I don't know if it is or not, but exactly how the questions are going to be written. Which one affects nucleic acid synthesis? So where's my pen? Let's see, let's see. And I did this more or less so I could talk about the other kinds of drugs as well and knock them out in this one slide. But we're going to talk about vancomycin, right? That affects the cell wall. Bacitracin. This is also found in Neosporin because it's a triple antibiotic cream, right? Or triple antibiotic ointment. Um, this is, bacitracin is a wall also. Another weirdy wall. It's not your beta-lactam. You know, I've put it right up against with that vancomycin and bacitracin running around wild with each other in the cell wall category. And um, polymyxins. These are going to be the membrane affecting ones. And these are the only ones that I need you to know about for the membrane affecting antibiotics. There is another one, but you don't, I don't want you to worry about it. So then we have trimethoprim. Trimethoprim falls in the category of the sulfa drugs. Um, sulfadiazine and stuff like this, right? The other ones have sulfa in the name, so they're like dead giveaways. So just be aware that's uh, trimethoprim falls in that category. So this, and if they're sulfa, so you're like, yeah, okay, so it falls in sulfa, cool. What does it affect? Folic acid synthesis. Okay. So that leaves us with ciprofloxacin. All right, so most of the, well, I would say in general, what we learned about in the course was the things that inhibit um, nucleic acid synthesis in general, the drugs that are involved in that, they fall into this category called fluoroquinolones. And it's a nice fancy word and I like the way that it sounds, but none of the names of the drugs are have anything to do with fluoroquinolone, unfortunately. <laughs> so... What do they end with or how's a way that we can recognize them? Because we saw in proteins in general, the mycins, that's going to block protein synthesis, right? So the fluoroquinolones, what do they end in to help us remember about the nucleic acid synthesis stuff? Floxacin. So floxacin means fluoroquinolone and fluoroquinolone is nucleic acid inhibition. And when we talk about DNA and um, nucleotides, whether it's the A, the T, the C, the G, or the phosphate, or the pentose, five sugar um, molecule involved, um, ribose for the RNA and deoxyribose for the DNA, yeah? When we talk about those things, that's the same across all living organisms. So if that exact same chemical structure, everything. So if it's going to affect synthesis of DNA, for one organism, there's a risk that it could affect that in another organism. So these can be pretty, this can be pretty toxic. All right, next question. What kind of microbial infection would prosequantal treat? Again, this would be a good example of the question, type of question on the exam. So our choices are protozoa, enteryx, helminths, and fungi. So we're gonna work through these. We already know, I'm gonna point the two of them out right now. You should know, especially by working through the lab with our EMB and our McConkie stuff, 
you hear me say enteric all the time. So what are we working with? What type of organism were we working with in the lab? Bacteria, right? Enterics, bacteria. So I'm going to point at that one. This one here, gram positive. That's bacteria. Yeah. So we just went through, that's all the antibiotics, by the way, the ones that we went through, the ones that you need to know. And the ones that are on your slide over here. Did we uh, mention any sort of weird caveat for enterics or gram positive? No. Is proziquantel one of those uh, medications that we talked about in the previous slides? It isn't. If you were to go back and look at it. So um, we can already mark those off of the list. So you can just take them out. You don't even have to know what proziquantel was. You would just have to know that that proziquantel wasn't in the antibiotic category. Next, um, we have our choices of protozoa, helminths, and fungi. Well, the fungi kind of have a dead giveaway in a lot of their medications. The two, like kind of two big, um, it's like a whole group, the macrolide type um, antifungals. But um, the bigger, bigger group that to be aware of with fungi is the azoles. So ketoconazole, myconazole, and that sort of thing. And these are things you've probably heard of when I say them out like that. You can find these in over-the-counter um, antifungal treatment or um, like yeast infections, because remember, yeast is a fungi. Um, so um, the other medication that we would recognize for our fungi, other than the azoles, is going to be um, amphotericin. B. If you can remember that fungi is amphotericin B for your purposes and azoles, again, for your purposes. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm giving you a very watered down list, of course. Um, if you can remember that, then you would, can recognize proziquantel does not end in azole and it is not amphotericin B. So proziquantel is not what's going to be treating fungi. I'm not going to pull out some rando antibiotic that we did not talk about on the slide. That's che that's cheating on my part. So I told you it would be on there. You can trust that. So proziquantel is on the slide. I'm sure you guys are looking at it. And you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, get to it. We already know. Yeah, I know. But I'm just trying to help you guys whenever you need to break this down. So, um, and then we have the protozoa um, and the helminths. And, and then this... This is something that I guess I have to just uh, chalk this one up to memorization, kind of like the, some of the antibiotics, yeah. Um, Proziquantel and ivermectin are the two main um, drugs that I want you to be aware of for treating helminth infections. And do we remember what helminths are? Again, these are mostly worms. So I think helminths and worms. So one of the most common infections that we might talk about in the United States, as far as a helminth infection, other than whenever I was talking to you guys about pinworms and little kids, but that's pretty common, probably the more common one for um, humans. But in general, in the United States, probably heartworms. Um, so yeah, so those aren't uncommon infections. So proziquantel and ivermectin. Now we're talking about treating eukaryotic infections. These organisms are eukaryotes and they're higher level eukaryotes. They have organs and stuff. So now we're running into risks of also harming our tissues more and more as we treat with drugs that affect them. So that's the danger, right? We should already be able to think about it because in the same realm, the same concept, in the same line of thinking, we have that allergy hypothesis that the whole reason that we're having allergies is because our immune system isn't being trained properly how to deal with its IgE, which normally is used to fight against worms. So um, you can already see that if that's normally going to be fighting against worms and the worms aren't there and now it's causing problems for us, how similarly we could be um, affected by something that would affect the worms, including their drugs to treat the things. So that's all I wanted to bring up for you guys as far as toxicity of these drugs. We have to consider that since they're so, so similar to us. We have a lot different from bacteria. We don't have peptidoglycan in our cells at all. So immediately, let's attack that. 
So there's that idea. All right, then. Um, and then the protozoa, um, again, we already told you what the answer was, but I just do want to bring up protozoal uh, infections are going to be treated by, um, for malaria specifically, and that is kind of an important one to be aware of. For malaria, you're going to have quinine-based drugs, including something like the more common one, chloroquine. And that quin is the giveaway for the quinine part of it. Um, the other popular antiprotozoa drug that I want you to be aware of is one of those tricky shift to another category drugs, metronidazole. Remember for the mycins, when we were talking about um, affecting protein synthesis, we said vancomycin didn't fall into that category, it went over to the cell wall, right? So now we're talking about, um, if you were looking at the fungi, which I said were the azoles, this is the guy that took a trip to, you know, the big town, the eukaryotes, and um, the more advanced eukaryotes like the protozoa. You can also use it to treat um, the anaerobic bacterial infections as well. So um, yeah, it's kind of a multi multiplayer. So yeah, it went to the big leagues. You could think of it that way. It's the azole that went to the big leagues. It doesn't treat fungal infections. All right. This next question is pretty basic and we've all like a lot of words. So, but um, super infection. Explain what causes super infection. You're a patient, you're getting a knee replacement surgery. They put you on antibiotics beforehand um, to helpfully get rid of bacteria in your body that could potentially contaminate during the surgery. And to already have the antibiotics in place, when they put things in your body, the antibiotics are already there, ready to get rid of any bacteria that might have come in maybe with any of the parts, right? So we start you on that first. You take the antibiotic, you have your simple, um, say simple, but they're very common, knee replacement surgery. And then you wake up in your hospital bed and um, they're looking at you, making sure you're okay. And you end up having a terrible GI uh, syndrome called pseudomembranous colitis. And you guys know this as C. diff. You just call it C. diff and that's fine. That's fine. Um, what happened there is when you took your antibiotics, it killed off your normal bacterial flora. So think of it as like, remember how I say your normal flora anywhere in your body, they're taking up the stadium seats so that the bad guys can't come and sit down. Now we've cleared out the whole stadium. One of the guys that was in the, one of the stadium seats, Clostridium difficile. So when you took your antibiotics and cleared out everybody else, Clostridium difficile is looking around going, heck yeah, I've got all this space now that I can take up right? So it does, and it multiplies, and um, and it's doing its own thing. It thinks it's fine, whatever. It doesn't know that it's having caused any problems. And it causes even more problems because it also generates endospores. And we've already seen in our lab that even whenever you're having dividing bacteria that are getting nutrients, they'll still make endospores. So um, it's hard to get rid of endospores. We talked about that in chapter 11. Um, but anyways, and that leads to the same problem in other people in the hospital who are also on antibiotics and stuff. So um, super infection, basically, antibiotic kills off the normal bacterial flora. And now you have overgrowth by endospore producers, typically, or non-bacterial species. Like if you take an antibiotic for a UTI, and now you have a yeast infection because antibiotics don't kill the yeast, they're fungi. Okay, chapter 15, in chapter 15 and 16, I know these are the biggies. I uh, know 16 is the biggest one, but chapter 15, how does lysozyme work as part of, the, as part of the first line of defense? The first line of defense is dealing with the initial entry barriers, whether that's like nostril hairs blocking things from getting in or mucus trapping things or tears washing things out. Um, Just the tears themselves. Uh, so. Lysozyme is an enzyme that our body makes that specifically breaks down peptidoglycan. So now you already know that our body is very much aware of the peptidoglycan problem. Um, 
But yeah, it specifically breaks down peptidoglycan and we have it in our saliva and we have it in our tears. You can have it in other body fluids. You also have lysosome, I'm sorry, lysozyme in your lysosomes and your um, phagocytes, right? So that's where that phagolysosome whole thing comes whenever we're digesting a bad guy. So um, lysosome's a pretty big one. The other one I'd be aware of as far as special molecules that are in it's on the, the actual slide is um, keratin. And most of us know what keratin is. It's in our, you know, our nails and it provides a waterproofing barrier in our skin and stuff. So that's what it does. And that's part of the first line of defense as well. All right, name three types of granulocytes that are the most important in the innate immune response. So one of the giveaways that we have for the granulocytes in our innate immune response is fill. So these are the fills, the neutrophils and the basophils and the eosinophils. There is another kind of granulocyte called a mast cell, which we talked about in the allergy area, but it ain't on your slide, okay? So uh, then fills, right? So we already know that neutrophil is gonna be by far the most numerous. It's going around phagocytosing or eating up um, foreign material all over the place and it breaks it down and it releases stuff in response to um, signals. It, it gives signals and the whole inflammatory response. And it's great at like, just like destroying things generally. Then we have the basophils and the eosinophils. Basophils, we'll just say, um, have a somewhat similar purpose as the mast cells did when we're talking about those and um, allergies. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, and their basophils and eosinophils are not going to be anywhere near as numerous in your, you know, CBC counts as the basophils and the eosinophils. And the eosinophils, we also do see those involved with allergies as well. They can be quite elevated in individuals who have chronic allergies. Um, but the, the eosinophils typically associated, again, now go figure, I already told you guys to, to wonder about this, typically associated with attacking helminth infections. So interesting, right? I think it is anyways. Um, let me see, I'm not missing any other really interesting information. When we talk about the development of pus as a byproduct of the inflammatory response, it is largely going to be made up of neutrophils because they're like our big responder when it comes to an inflammatory response as far as destroying um, the bad guys or foreign material or um, dead cell material or whatever it is, breaking that down. Um, so they're going to be there, of course, anytime that we have some sort of like waste liquid being made. And that essentially is what pus is. It's like an exudate associated with that inflammatory response. So we have neutrophils there. We have the bad guys like bacteria there. And we have fluids associated with the inflammatory response as well. Of course, because all of this happens in, it's not in a completely arid, dry environment. And that's where everything travels within the fluids within our body. So naturally there's going to be fluids there. And remember the fluids contain the signaling molecules as well. No. That's where that would come from. Yeah, I'm good with this. Okay, next thing, question three, what is a PAMP and what is it all about? This one's pretty straightforward one. PAMP stands for Pathogen Associated Molecular Pattern. There may be questions, um, I say questions, like I'm gonna ask like a thousand questions about PAMPs or something, I'm not. Uh, I'm, I think there's a question about a PAMP on the test. I know there is at least one PAMP question. But I think it asks for you to um, pick the answer with like a, like what does PAMP, it'll say like, what does PAMP stand for? And then you have a P-A-M-P -P word and you have to choose the right four words. So I'm just letting you guys know, don't just be able to recognize P-A-M-P -P word, be able to recognize the correct words. So pathogen associated molecular pattern already ding, ding, ding in our mind. We should be thinking about when we think about typical pathogens that we learn about in this class, the bacteria pathogens, that they have peptidoglycan, that the gram negative ones like the enterics that you know might be growing in our gut, they have 
LPS, lipopolysaccharide, or um, also known as endotoxin. And we've talked a lot about endotoxin in this chapter, for sure. Um, it's just one of those things that our body can recognize immediately as bad. And that's what a PAMP is. This is not a specific response. This is a very general response. You have peptidoglycan, therefore we kill. So this is not like saying you are, you know, group A streptococcus, and now we kill with our specific antibodies against that. That's not happening here. This is a very general response. All right. So innate immune um, white blood cells. So these are going to be like uh, the phagocytes that are involved in our innate response, like the neutrophils. <laughs> we'll recognize that as a sign of an invader and, um, and react to it appropriately and then release signal molecules, remember the cytokines, to uh, call other cells that are nearby to come to war. Um, PAMPs are recognized by something called, I can't, there's so much hair, my own hair all over me. Um, PAMPs are recognized by special receptors called PRRs or pattern recognition receptors. This is literally their pattern recognition receptors. They're super boring. There's a receptor that recognizes the PAMPs on these cells. So not anywhere near as specific as like the T cell receptor or the B cell receptor, which is very important to remember. Aside from loss of function, because there are technically five aspects like descriptors that we could assign to the inflammatory response, um, taking loss of function out, what are the other four words associated with inflammation? Um, so let's go through them. I'm sure you guys remember them. Kind of old school terms like Latin type terms. We have rubor. This is rubor is dealing with the redness that we see associated with the inflammatory response. Calor, which is the warmth in the area. Dolor, that's the pain associated with this. And tumor, this is the swelling. Um, and of course, we're talking about this in relation to infections. But this happens also anytime you have any damage in the body. Even if you were to fall down in the most sterile area in the world and bump your knee, you would still have redness around the area. It would be warm around the area. You would have pain from it and there would be swelling. All of that's gonna happen anytime that there's any sort of inflammatory reaction. So these are the signs of inflammation and are not necessarily associated only with disease. Disease also has these though. That was everything I wanted to say, yes. Yeah. So I yeah, I explained the kind of the obvious, an obvious situation like scraping your knee. That's like, like one of my favorite ones to go to. But can you think about how these concepts, the Ruber Calor Dollar uh dollar tumor terms, can you think about how those terms would apply to the last time um that you or a friend or a family member um was injured? or ill. And I think in real world scenario for your for your own um, ability to apply these to situations because these aspects of inflammation are so universal. All right, what's the purpose of a fever? I wonder how many of you thought there was an actual benefit to a fever before. <laughs> but a lot of people didn't think so. All right, so fevers, they increase our cellular metabolism. Um, so that we can have energy made faster. Remember that heat kind of correlates with energy. So uh, if you have that heat going on, sign that we can be making more energy and more supplies that are going to be involved in the attack, right? To help us fight faster. It also increases our pro protective responsive activity to um, the bad guys by our white blood cells. So it just means they can get there faster. They can release their stuff faster. They can respond to the signaling faster. Everything's literally just, everything's going faster. We'll get to the location faster, all of it. And it creates an unfriendly environment for the microbes. Um, they're a little bit more sensitive to the temperature than, I mean, we have a whole body going for us. They've got their one, like one cell for each individual. So um, the temperature hopefully is unfriendly to the microbes so that they um, their enzymes can't function the way that they're supposed to. And that can cause them to have problems with growth and stuff. So that's the benefits we can have by fever. And remember that fever is going to be triggered by molecules 
that we refer to as pyrogens. And yeah, I feel like it's pretty safe when you hear the term pyrogen, you think of pyro and you think of fire. And it, that to me, you think pyro, fire, that's hot. Fevers are hot. So pyrogens trigger fevers, okay? Um, we have two versions of pyrogens, like a lot of the stuff that we talk about in these chapters. We have endogenous and exogenous. So endogenous is signals sent from our own cells to make a fever. And um, exogenous are any of the signals that might be transmitted from like pathogens or whatever, like um, endotoxin and that sort of a thing that triggers a fever, then that is an exogenous pyrogen. Mm, yeah. All right. Um, list the three different complement pathways and tell me what complement does. Okay. Let's start with the three pathways. Classical, lectin, and alternative. And almost always, if I am um, put by myself to have to talk about these three pathways, I will always forget one of them. So <laughs> I have to list them out and remember them as a set. I don't know why, but that's just how my brain decided to work with it. So um, do what you need to do to remember it for yourself. But let's start with classical. This is our base one. This is when we talk about the most in the class. <clears throat> it's triggered by the presence of antibody. Typically IgG is what we're talking about. Remember how I told you about what a big heavy hitter IgG is in comparison to any of the other um, antibodies, right? Especially when we're starting with IgM, with that pentamer, and it's not made in very uh, big concentration and it's not very, that's just not as effective. Let's just put it that way. It's just not as effective. And that pentamer just can't do as much. I mean, you can't interact with complement quite the same way because that constant region of your antibody isn't free to interact with. So IgG being a monomer is going to be much better at doing that. So, um, so yeah, if there's antibody on something that'll trigger your complement pathway. Next we have lectin. This is essentially dealing with surface sugars on the microbes like mannose and lectin, um, binding to that and recognizing that for the complement pathway. Just be aware that it exists, please. And then the alternative pathway, which is triggered by um, the presence of kind of general bad guy molecules like LPS. That's the more common one that we refer to for the alternative pathway. LPS, lipopolysaccharide, is endotoxin. It's present on gram-negative bacteria. So um, but they're very PAMP-like molecules. Yeah, general identification molecules. And um, I was going to say, yeah, pathogen-associated molecular pathogen. I was like, yeah, that is what PAMP is. So you already know that, though. <laughs> so um, that's that. And remember that complement, this whole system, is referring to about 50 proteins floating around in your bloodstream at all times. They don't have to be made in response to something. They're just always hanging out, ready to go. So that's a very efficient way to start triggering a reaction to whatever. So, um, but I say reaction to whatever, but what does that mean, reaction to something? And this is what I mean. This is our functions of complement. This is what it does. It helps. Um, so it does opsonization. And I've said this word so many freaking times now, but opsonization, just to remind you guys, opsonization, it deals with like, basically it's hard to eat up the bacteria that have the capsules. And you guys have seen, like I said, in class, you've seen that capsules are actually pretty common and they make it harder for the uh, phagocytes, our protective cells, our sentry guys to eat up those bad guys. And we need them to do that, not just to fight up front, like the neutrophils will do for us, um, but also to start the whole signaling pathway with our more specific immune response. So if they can't eat up the bad guy in the first place, they can't even start this whole thing. So we need them to be able to do that. Well, complement um, helps with that via opsonization. Opsonization, you stick some complement on there, now, suddenly, it's a lot easier for the phagocytes to latch on and basically use it like a handle to eat them up. Um, then we have cytolysis. And remember, cyto being cell and lysis being break open. Cytolysis, breaking open of the cells, is accomplished by a complement 
via that membrane attack complex. All that is complement proteins that are coming together and they literally, it's like, you remember how you learned how like a, um, an arch is built and how it like supports its own weight and stuff. <laughs> That's what I always think of when I think of these guys, they stick together like that and sort of rely on that shape to create holes. Like here's your bad guy and there's a hole and now its contents are going to be leaking out, leaking out as well as some of our defensive molecules getting in a little bit easier. We also have inflammation, which we just talked about, right? And starting that whole process. And it's important to start that process so that our cells can work better. And that can get us faster to our specific response. That is the goal. Clearing the infection is the goal. The fastest way you're going to do it are adaptive immunity by far. Make sure I didn't leave something behind. Okay, good. All right, so chapter 16, of course, that's going to be our adaptive and selective immunity. Our first question for this chapter, how do lymphocytes make sure to expel clones that have the anti-self reactivity? So they're attacking self and then proliferate only one clone that responds to one epitope instead of all clones in the entire repertoire. Yeah, you want to... Get rid of anything that is anti-self. And when you go to activate a cell, only activate that one cell that responds to that one thing and not everything that's like sitting nearby. That'd be ridiculous. Especially when I tell you guys that we have the propensity to potentially respond to like 8.5 billion antigens, basically anything in the universe. Uh, that's a lot of each, each of those having its own cell. We don't have all of them, of course, but... Uh, yeah, so that term for that situation, getting rid of the anti-self and only uh, growing out and proliferating the cell that we want, that's clonal selection. That's the term for it. This happens early and um, during maturation in the bone marrow with those lymphocyte stem cells. Um, yeah, that was a pretty short one, I guess. Next, we have the Antigen presenting cells, which antigen presenting cell is able to present exogenous antigen on the MHC2 complex? So it's not just one, I said APCs. Okay, yeah, good. It's multiple. So, what are which cells can do that? So, there's three major ones, especially the ones that we focused on in the class. The ones that can act um, in response to exogenous antigens and uh, present them on their MHC2. And then remember on the MHC2, I'm gonna do the thing on the MHC2, <laughs> that that cell's holding that out. And then the T cell with the corresponding matchup comes over with its T cell receptor. And then they're happy about that when they dock together and send signals to one another, activating one another and saying, yay, we finally um, get to hang out. So, um, so that's the idea of how MHC works. MHC2 came from outside. So this is the special one. You guys remember how MHC1, everybody has it? Yeah. MHC2, a little bit more special. You have to have a key card, basically, to get into this party. So um, MHC2 can be presented by antigen-presenting cells, macrophages, dendritic cells, very close in function, and then the B cells. And monocytes can technically classify within this, but you know if they're going into the tissues to respond to all of this, then they're going to be macrophages when they transform uh, and they're activated. So I just didn't want you guys to forget that they exist. Um, so macrophages, dendritic cells, and B cells, these are the ones that um, we're going to focus on. So the, we see that B cells are in this. And we're talking about an innate response, that antigen presenting on the MHC2 Innate cells do that. Antigen presenters do that. Like, why are our fancy B cells doing this? B cells have two function, two functions. Their innate function and their specific functions. Their innate function is to go around and do this, be antigen presenting cells. Um, their actual specific specific 
um, response function, that's going to be making antibody, essentially. That's their goal in the end, as plasma cells, right? They're not called B cells anymore because we have to get fancy for that. Um, yeah, I don't want to miss something. I think I did. Okay, so exogenous out or outside antigen picked up from the outside, um, eaten up and digested by the antigen presenting cell, whichever one you want to pick, and then presented onto the surface of that antigen presenting cell, where then a T cell comes and reacts to it. Now, to initiate all of this and get this all started, the first T cell group that we have to interact with is the CD4 positive. So already, you know, if I say CD4 positive, you should be thinking that's the helper T cell. CD4, helper. The four looks more like an H to me than the eight does. Those are your only two options. So um, T helper cells, they're going to be... Um, activated there. And why are they so important? They're like super important because they're basically going to be activating either side of our defense pathways. So here we have MHC2 presenting an antigen from outside that was digested and presented on our APC, came from outside. So now we're going to want a response that leans in favor of things that are outside of the cell. So these are going to trigger our CD4 uh, T helper cells to mature into the CD4 positive T helper 2 or TH2 cells. The TH2 cells are going to lean more towards activating our B cells and turning them by activating them into the plasma cells and the memory cells and the regulatory cells, right? That happens at the same time. That's the whole thing going on with all of that. Um, and that's why that part is so important as far as which MHC it is presented on. Because if it had been MHC1, like in a viral infection, we picked up a part of it and put it on our surface from inside of us, if it had been that, we would have activated on MHC1 just because it's on MHC1. Instead of the CD4 T helper cell becoming two, it would be uh, CD4 T helper cell one. And that's gonna favor cytotoxic T cell pathway. So it can help with activating the cytotoxic T cells. So that is like the tank going out and taking care of all, just mowing down all uh, the uh, stuff that it needs to get rid of. And if you're infected, it's coming to get you. So that's the idea with that. Um, always it's gonna be CD4 positive T helper cell. It's just a matter of if it came from the inside, MHC1, T helper cell one, TH1. CD8 response. If it came from inside, that's, per, uh, sorry, from outside? Yeah. If it came from outside, um, your antigen presenting cell will process it and put it on the MHC2. That then signals the TH2 activation, which will favor activating the B cell, which then produces antibody. The antibody the B cell makes at first, IgM. Not as useful, but it's what they can make right away. So in the meantime, while it is working towards a more effective antibody, which is IgG, we'll make and use IgM. But you've already seen the charts. Once we, once we have the IgM, the fight is over. Or the IgG, the fight is over. That's our heavy hitter. We've seen how like, uh, yeah, IgM, okay, good. Like it's helping out and we're getting kind of better and better. Once the IgG shows up, it's over, man. Um, so that's pretty much how that is meant to work in your body. And that's why that heavy hitter, that IgG, the next time that you see that illness that made you sick while you were waiting to build up all of this, the next time you see it, your body's ready with the IgG right away. And because of that, you don't even know that you saw the thing. That's so impressive. I think it is. Um, that I just ran through the entire immune system just then. All right, I just want to be sure I didn't miss something good. The only thing I want to bring up outside of that would be um, the regulatory cells and the memory cells, right? Just remember they're there, guys. Uh, if you get activated, the first thing you're going to do is proliferate. So you'll make clones, da -da -da -da, all copies of yourself. And then those clones are going to turn into whatever their thing is that they're doing, whether it's the TH2 cell to go 
activate the people for the, um, you know, antibody response by the B cells or the memory cell that's going to kind of hang out until you need it next time or the regulatory cell that's going to make sure that you're not going to over respond to things, right? They all have that stuff. Anytime you activate any of these, they do that. So let me see. All right, which lymphocyte is important for cross-activating the B cell so that it can undergo its metamorphosis? So we were just talking about that, right? If you need to activate your B cell, it was just doing its innate stuff, being an APC, antigen presenting cell. But now this cell comes along. It's been activated and it's ready to interact with the B cell to help it turn on to make uh, antibody, right? To become a plasma cell that makes antibody. That cell is the T helper cell, right? Everybody has to encounter it first because we have to have a checkpoint for these things so that things don't get out of control. So that's our CD4 positive T helper type two, TH2. The H is just helper, it's not meant to be separate. Um, yeah, now it once, once a CD4, always a CD4. Okay. So the CD4s, if you think helper right away, the only thing it's ever going to do is be a helper cell. It's not going to turn into as something else. So it's only ever going to be a helper of some kind. Remember once a CD8, always a CD8, same thing. So it's not going to turn into a non CD8 thing. It's always going to be the cytotoxic T cells. Okay. Um, so yeah, those T helper cells, man, they keep showing up pretty much everywhere that we're going to be um, talking about anything getting activated in this entire process. They're that important, which is also important to remember, which I just friggin uh, lectured you guys about on whatever days were happening most recently, Wednesday, Thursday, about HIV. And the whole problem with it, actually targeting our T helper cells, you know, favoring those over the other immune cells that it can infect those T helper cells getting depleted is like you can't activate anything what are you gonna do well you're gonna die that's what you're gonna do so it's that bad yeah if you don't if you don't treat HIV it's 100 percent fatal so um it's important we can get your viral loads down to near zero undetectable levels uh, but it will always be there with you because it hides out in your genome remember so that's a very important thing to remember. Uh, yeah. No, what, why is this jumping around when I click on it? I'm so I'm reading. I'm right there. Yeah, yeah, differentiating. Yeah, yeah. So we did walk through this process, but we'll walk through it kind of again. Um, even if you were the B cell acting as the actual antigen presenting cell. Let's say you're hanging out, even in like your lymph node as your innate response as a B cell, you're an antigen presenting cell. You pick up something from outside of you, you digest it, you present it because it was outside of you onto your MHC2. That's exogenous one, right? So it's on your MHC2 as an innate version. Um, then a T cell, T helper cell comes by, it interacts and they match up T cell receptor to MHC with the antigen. And they get happy and they send signals to one another, right? So that's happening. That activates the T helper cell to actually like, um, you know, go and become the T helper type two cells and do that function and go down that line. But that um, can also go back and interact with the B cells themselves to activate them and trigger them to differentiate into the plasma cells that make the antibodies. And then start that process of IgM first and then moving into IgG and then we squashed it, we won. All right, what are the three, oh, I'm sorry. Name three out of the six functions of antibody. And if you can name all six, bonus. Um, we had this sort of like, I guess as a question for those of you who get the quiz before class, and then it's basically um, this. I had you like name one and tell me like how it works. So I listed all of them at the end of that quiz. Um, and so it's the same thing here. 
First thing I'm going to start with, I should have started with agglutination, but we'll work our way down to it. Neutralization first. In neutralization, basically, um, we're going to be binding to the receptors of like the virus, like the spike proteins and how that's how it is its key to get into the lock on our cells. The spike proteins, these antibodies will bind specifically to those spike proteins and prevent that exact exchange from occurring. That's neutralization. Opsonization. We kind of talked about this, right? But the antibodies will stick to the outside of the body, makes it easier for our phagocytes to pick them up and eat them. Um, coding. I mean, I feel like that kind of, <laughs> kind of explains itself, but covering a thing completely in antibody. And then for that thing, um, can't do its thing because it's all covered up in that. Agglutination works in a similar concept just because we're having the things stick to each other via those antibodies reacting to them. So they're just all clumped up by the antibodies sticking to them. That's called agglutination. And that makes it so they can't do their thing. Um, and then we have the complement pathway being activated, which we talked about previously. That's the classical pathway, remember? And then we have antitoxin function of the antibodies, where those antibodies are going to bind to toxins produced by the bacteria, not the um, way that, not their molecules that help them get into our cells, not just coating the outside or causing them to clump together. Now, specifically the toxin that they produce, our antibodies react directly with that so that the toxin can't do what it's trying to do. So a lot of times, if you can block the toxin, it actually blocks like the effect of the um, infections in general. So, um, that's it. That's what antibody does. All right. What are the five types of antibody and tell me which one, uh, what they, each one does. This is, looks like a lot of information, but I don't feel like it is. So we already know IgM is our uh, first one. It's a pentamer. So a Y. Y they're all sticking together with their, um, I say the handle like region, but the constant regions. Um, and they look like snowflakes. So um, that's just the one that's made first. It's not particularly effective, but that's its purpose to be made first. IgG, it's like our preferential one that we typically switch to next. It is a monomer. Um, so like I said, it can cause it can lead to a lot of activation of different kinds of pathways. Those six functions of antibody that we just talked about, IgM is not effective at all of those. IgG is, IgG is really effective at them. So, um, yeah, so we can do all that good stuff. IgA, this is a dimer version. So it's like the Ys are stuck like out like this and then their uh, constant regions stick together like that. Um, and anyways, that's usually found in mucous membrane areas. So this is just a version of antibody that is just more stable in that and more effective in that mucousy environment. That's why it is the way that it is, why it's different. IgD was really just the surface receptor. Um, and then, yeah, it's not going to be secreted really ever. It's just going to be on the surface. IgE, we now know it's usually going to be uh, used for parasite in response, but um, it's also involved in allergies. So that's the five types. Why is the secondary immune response faster? Well, we kind of talked about this already. All right, the primary response, we need to activate the lymphocytes. Then we will proliferate. They'll turn into whatever thing they're gonna do. Memory, the thing, the job one, if we call it the effector cell, it does the job. Um, and then the regulator for each kind of lymphocyte. And then we have to go and activate the other lymphocytes because usually it's gonna be Fight the thing, get the um, Th helper cell activated. Now he has to grow out and then go and activate the either the B cell side or the T cell side, and they have to grow and act into their thing, grow and make antibody or grow and go out and kill things. It takes a lot of time. So that whole phase where that is happening and where all of that is um, occurring and it we don't have our antibody to support us yet and our actual response to re support us yet there, that is called the latent phase. And so that's where your innate response is working, but um, 
you know, your, your big bads haven't come in really to respond. So anyways, that has to happen on your first response. On your second response, you have your memory cells. They're just going to respond pretty much right away and start doing the things almost right away. We don't have to wait for IgM to become IgG. We're already just IgG in it up. Um, so that makes it a lot faster for our bodies to respond to infections whenever we see them the second time. It is essentially the goal of vaccines to set that up so that when you walk by that little kid that has measles because his mom is an anti-vaxxer um, or you're treating somebody in your hospital that has that mindset, that because if, if you have had your measles vaccine, you won't even bat an eyelash at it. You wouldn't even know. You're not going to get a sniffle. You just won't know. It's pretty cool stuff. Okay, I think that's pretty good. Yeah. For, um, give an example of natural active immunity and artificial active immunity. And what's the difference between these? So natural active, that's responding to something that you got from, let's say, nature, not from a medical setting. A doctor didn't give this to you. You didn't get a shot. It wasn't infused into you. You walked by that kid and you weren't immunized and you get sick. That is natural active because if you get sick and you recover and you're not going to get it again the next time you walk by, that's natural active immunity. You made your own antibodies. That's what active means. It's responding actively to it. And then you got a protective thing going on. And you did that because you encountered something naturally that was just in your environment. Artificial active, in contrast, still active. You're still going to make your own antibodies in response that can be protective. But now you're introduced to the thing because of medicine. So we're talking about vaccines here. It's a very good example. Um, But yeah, so those are kind of the differences between those. Um. If we were to look at, remember, there's also passive for each of these. So natural, passive. So that is getting antibodies from not your body, brought to you into your body naturally. And remember that our good example for that was um, via breast milk as a baby. Um, and then um, the passive, um, based artificial passive one. That is whenever we're going to be like giving somebody infusions of um, immunoglobulin or even getting shots like Humira, which are monoclonal antibodies. So we are giving those antibodies to somebody. But antibodies usually do hold up pretty well. Um, can They're engineered basically to hold up for like a, a couple of months even. So it's pretty impressive, but uh, you still aren't going to make them yourself. So making sure I'm not missing anything. Chapter 17, these are our disorders of the immune system. So which type of immune response molecule is involved in the type one hypersensitivities? So type one, remember hyper and hypo are what we're dealing with. There's four kinds of hyper and two kinds of hypo. So um, which type of immune response for type one? This is our allergy response. Um, so that's gonna be our IgE. Um, antibodies. So we're going to develop IgE, and instead of using it against worms, which it should be used for, now we're using it against, you know, cat dander and um, penicillin and stuff. So um, once you have seen the cat dander for the first time, your body will go through that whole activation and proliferation and then activate the next one, and it proliferates and differentiates, and then da 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 It has to go through that on the first one, just like you would with an initial illness. Um, then whenever you come around that allergen the second time and every time after that, you're going to have that quick response, the quick response that with our vaccines in the previous, um, examples with our vaccines, um, uh, makes it so that we didn't even know that we walked by somebody with measles. Now it's going to produce the IgE just as fast. And that's going to trigger our mast cell response. Remember, it's going to stick on the outside of those mast cells. They're going to wave those antibodies around, those IgEs around like a freaking flag. And when it gets activated, um, it's going to, you know, eject all of its, you know, uh, histamine and everything that leads to the inflammatory response that we associate with allergies. 
That's so you have to have that happen, sensitization first, and then everything afterwards. I mean, you're screwed, right? That's basically what how it goes. Um, yeah, so it works the same thing, same thing as the illnesses, but just IgE is our operating antibody there. So remember, this also will like kind of go back to that hygiene hypothesis of, um, oh, it already says it on the slide. I didn't even realize it. Yeah, of that we're so clean in our society, we're so protected from all of our illnesses that perhaps now because we are not um, using, our immune system is not being used the way that it was intended to, um, that we're overreacting to other things that we shouldn't be even reacting to at all. But we can retrain it, right? Remember how I told you guys, we can um, give you like doses of it with certain signals and little doses with certain signal molecules with it and get your body to make IgG instead of the IgE. If you make IgG against your allergen, it's going to bind up with that allergen and IgE is not going to have a chance to get a foothold with that. And then you are no longer allergic. All right, which type of which type of blood? <laughs> Sorry, it's just a weird thing to read out. Which type of blood can each of the four blood groups receive and why? Um, and so another related concept, why are what are those blood groups defined by? This one's pretty um, I feel like the the blood stuff that we talked about with this type two response, the hyper reactivity. Um is a lot more, I feel like it's very, very closely pertinent to pretty much what any of you are going to go look in, look at in the healthcare industry, because I do think you need to be aware of this, since there can still be mistakes made in this area. So, if you are A, just imagine like literally having these uh, letters on your little skull, and uh, if, and you know, A looks different than B, and B looks different from A. And if you, if you look different than the other guy, then you don't like him and you punch him in the face. If you have A and B, A sees the A and he's like, oh, hey, buddy. And the B sees the B. And I'm like, oh, hey, buddy. And so you're A, B walking around and everybody, uh, you know, is happy to be donated to you. So A, B, because of that, that means A, B is our universal recipient they can get any blood type because remember the O is just the foundation. It's like your head. If I'm talking about putting an A on your head, putting a B on your head, your head is essentially going to represent our O, not just the red blood cell, but also our foundational O. So that's the idea. So A can receive A on B and O because that's the foundation and everybody has that. B, it can receive B Oppie and O, because that's the foundation, and everybody can receive that. AB can receive A, because it sees it as friendly. Um, it can receive B, because it sees it as friendly. Obvi, it can receive AB, because it sees that as friendly. Um, and Oppie, it can receive O, because that's the foundation. Everybody has that. So that's why it's the universal recipient. O, however, it sees O and thinks, no thanks. I mean, it sees, it sees A and thinks no thanks. It sees B and thinks no thanks. And if it sees both at the same time, it thinks really no thanks. O can only receive O. There's one on that frill on the outside. Only wants an O. So this is a problem because since O can only receive O. And O negative, while, because we've talked about this, right? There's also a positive and a negative for the RH group. Which we can talk about in a moment, but um, sorry, it's just like my butt gets so tired in this chair. It's like the worst office chair, you guys. Okay, um, I don't remember what I was gonna say. Um, yeah, positive and negative. So that's what I was kind of talking about, right? Positive, you have a plus on your head. Negative, don't have a plus. That's just all it means. <laughs> so. So yeah, it's not a different thing. It's just, you don't have the plus. So think of it as the same way as a blood group. So if you're O and negative, that's the foundation for both of those. You can go to anybody. But O negative is not the most common blood type. That's kind of a problem. 
because if you get in an accident, we're going to give you own egg. But that's not what we have most of in blood banking. In blood banking, what we have the most of is O positive. So that's the most common blood type. So um, they're going to want to type you as soon as they can. So they're not wasting that precious liquid gold O neg, which they might want to save. Um, they have this thing in hospitals whenever you call and you have a situation where somebody is going to require quite a lot of blood that you weren't expecting, like a uh, nick an artery or something, or um, if you have incoming um, heavy trauma from like a big car wreck or something like where a whole bunch of people were involved and or a you know train derailment or something. Um, they call it the massive transfusion protocol. And usually it's for one person and they're like really bleeding out and they need a lot of blood right away. And it's this whole protocol that they have to go through. You better be given that person if you can their own blood type and not O negative if they don't need O negative. Because what if the next person comes in and they also need that protocol? So anyways, that's why that's so important when we're talking about that with regards to healthcare and blood banking. Of course, we know the importance of testing the blood types. We talked about that because if A, um, if you give an A, some B blood, if you give my dad's blood to me, my dad being B positive and I'm A positive, my dad gave his blood to me, I would see that B as some nonsense and my body would attack it. What would it attack it with? IgG. We've already said how that's a heavy hitter. So that is why getting the wrong blood type is usually deadly, commonly deadly. You're putting a whole bag of that into somebody. I'm not talking about a few viruses got into your body. Now we're talking about a whole bag. All right. All right, let's see. Question two, which type of blood can each of the four blood... Oh, right, this is just the answers, sorry. I didn't even realize I was reading the same thing because it looks so different with all those words on there. We already talked about this. We just went through it in our own, well, in my own mouth. All right. What um, causes hemolytic disease of the newborn? And I know that we talked about this and I know that I really try to drive this one home hard. And I know that's where we sat through that. But we're going to review it. Um, remember that hemolytic disease of the newborn, this has to do with that RH group the plus or minus after the A or the B or the O. Um, and yeah, so that has to do with blood types too, right? This is because the RH negative, the negative being that foundational, like that's the starting point, that um, she would see an RH positive. If we gave her a positive blood from somebody else, her body would see that as foreign and attack it. Well, if she's growing a baby in her body, that is positive because that's the gene that the dad imparted to it. Um, her negative body sees the positives as foreign and generates antibodies against it. Um, it takes a while for this whole interaction to occur during gestation, as well as when the mother's body starts to respond to this sort of stuff, because we had to go through the latent period. We're reacting just like as if it were a disease just like we did with the allergies. Now, um, like we did with the chicken pox. So the whole reason you get sick with that stuff is because you don't have IgG right away. You have to go through this um, ridiculous inflammatory response because you don't have IgG. You have to do with what you have. So now, so her first pregnancy, she's just getting to that point. She gives birth and the baby's fine, moves on with her life. And our second baby, she's pregnant again, and it, our baby is RH positive. Her body already has a reaction against the RH positive. Her body's going to start right away cranking out that IgG, right? We know it's going to be fast. We just talked about how it's fast. So while the baby is, uh, you know, developing during gestation, then the mother starts to react to it just naturally. And we don't even know that it's all happening because of barriers involved between the mother and the baby via, you know, placenta, an umbilical cord. Sorry. I guess it's just going to stay there. Um, basically protected. But when that protection is severed during birth, um, that's when we start seeing, um, you know, the effects of the mother's antibody attacking the child and that being a deadly interaction. 
Um, so that's why we give Rogam so that we can prevent the mother from, you know, having those antibodies working against the baby essentially. So, um, that's what Rogam is for. Just want to show I'm not missing anything. So, you know, we talked about this. Um, why is type four hypersensitivity referred to as delayed? I'm sure you guys noticed. Um, so we went through the type one hypersensitivities and those were, um, the allergies, the type two, the blood type related ones, type three, <laughs> we just like glazed right over that one. And I don't, I don't think I have any question related to it at all on this, on the review. Um, but it is in our slides. So hold on, let me bring that up. Just FYI, because the only thing that I brought up with relation to that one, the type three, that's the immune complexes. That's where the antibodies like are floating around in their little Y shape and they're getting stuck to the pathogen and then another one gets stuck, gets stuck to the, they just pour soda everywhere. It gets stuck to the pathogen. Um, anyways, and then there's a whole bunch of that going on. And create these like clumps of the antibody and the antigen. And that sometimes not all of that gets cleaned up after fighting off an infection. And that can cause it to stick within the um, endothelium or the lining, the inside lining of your like vessels. And when it does stick there, your neutrophils, which are freaking everywhere in your blood, um, they see that as a reason to start attacking and you know causing other cells to attack and all this stuff so that leads to the inflammation and damage of the tissue and we see that most commonly because it makes a lot of sense whenever we think of it in regard to um rheumatoid arthritis and um you know those things getting stuck in, in the tight spaces associated with our joints um but the one that we have in the slide is these words i can't say um but yeah this one, the uh, acute, let me just bring it because I didn't put it. This part here. Don't make me say it. Um, yeah, we talked about this. It's after you have strep and you developed antibodies against strep, but since strep has a surface that looks similar to our cells, who react against strep you can react against your own cells as well as um causing these immune complexes that can continue to be made because of that similarity as well anyways they get stuck in your kidneys and then you have inflammation and kidney damage there so that's that you were be, from, be able to recognize it when you see it is what i'm saying i'm not gonna ever ask you to say it because i cannot well i can but only like once a year or something. So that's type three, immune complexes, words I cannot say. Then we have the type four. This is the delayed type. So we're into this. So that's why I want to bring that up because I didn't want to miss another thing that was on the slide. All right. Type four reactions are delayed because they are cell mediated. So type one, that was IgE. Remember that was allergies. Type two, that's IgM and IgG. That's the blood type ones. Type three is immune complexes. It can be different antibodies, typically IgM and IgG. And type four, that's the only one. So these are all antibodies. This last one, cell mediated. If you hear cell mediated, that means T cells because that they do their jobs with their cells. They don't create, you know, antibody that does the job for them. Um, we call the B cell antibody side, by the way, we call that humoral immune response because it's, you know, in the humors, the fluids of your body. Anyways, your cell mediated response, what happens is even whenever you have memory built up for your cell mediated response, there is still a level of activation and um, rep not replication, what do I say? Proliferation, the multiplying of those cells that has to happen. We don't have our full um, army built back up. We have to take a little bit of time 
to build the army back up and then also call what we have back into game. So it takes a little longer here. We can't just start cranking out antibody like the B cells have going with them. And um, so that's the problem. So cells have to do the job themselves. Um, so they can't just have one cell cranking out in a body. Takes time. So it's delayed. Even on your next, your second exposure, your memory exposure, it's going to take a couple days for it to start working. So thank goodness for antibody, right? But that's in um, a disease response. But here we are talking about your cell mediated response. Essentially, what your body is doing is going to recognize like the cells that are coated with the poison ivy um, oils or whatever. It sees that as, um, oh, our cells are infected with something. Remember, MHC1 is going to be related to this. So they think the cells are infected with something. And essentially, uh, they start trying to kill those cells that they think are infected. So a couple of days after they see the, the thing, they're killing the cells on your skin. And that's why a couple of days after you've exposed yourself to poison ivy, you'll have this, you know, weepy rash developing on your skin because those cells are killing those cells. And that's essentially what it, uh, what's going on there. And that's why, kind of why it takes a while. Um, like I said, a couple of days. Graft rejection, if you have like a transplant, that's going to ha happen under the same umbrella. Um, we can have autografts, so skin from yourself onto another area of your body, like if you have a burn or something. Um, isografts from an identical twin, allografts from another person, and xenografts from animals, like um, heart valves from pigs or something. So your body just sees their... Let's say, I mean, I know I've gone through this, but let's remind you guys. You give me a kidney and your MHC doesn't look like my MHC. So immediately my body sees your MHC, even though it's not presenting anything. My body sees your MHC hanging out. And it's MHC1 because that's the one that all the cells have. Um, And my body comes and it's like, oh, yeah. And it starts reacting to it and, and killing, even though it's not holding out anything foreign. It sees the whole MHC as foreign because it's just the whole thing that's holding it up isn't right. Um, so that's why we have to have the gene typing whenever we are doing transplants because MHC, which we also refer to as HLA and transplant, um, has to match up as closely as we can get it. And that's the gene typing they're going to do. Um, and that's, I'm telling you because I used to do the gene typing, typing for this. That's the only gene they're going to do. You're not looking at any other genes in your entire body. They're only looking at your HLA, your MHC. Same thing. That's how important this is. That's what they care about because that's what you're going to react against. That's what's going to start this reaction and your cytotoxic T cells. Man, like I said, the, the tanks that come in and just start mowing things down, you don't want to react to, you don't want to activate that pathway. You don't want that going down. Um, It's a bad deal. So. Obviously, imagine if you, uh, how your reaction to poison ivy, right? It's terrible. Imagine that you put actual poison ivy into your body. That's what it thinks is going on. Um, yeah, so you do have a typically a prior sensitization, like if you had like tuberculosis and um, then your body developed a reaction to it. And then the next time, that you saw tuberculosis, now your cell-mediated immunity would kick right in. Or the next time that you see the PPD test that they give you on your arm, which represents tuberculosis antigen, you'll react to it right away because your uh, cell-mediated immunity already saw tuberculosis because you had it. Or hopefully you had the uh, vaccine, right? Or hopefully you just haven't reacted to it as well. <laughs> That's what I really hope. So what is the major difference between a primary immunodeficiency and a secondary. So now we've gone out of our um, hypersensitivities. Sorry, I couldn't think of the word. We've gone out of our hypersensitivities, uh, the type one, the allergies, the type two, the blood types, type three, the immune complexes that get stuck in small areas, and type four, the cell mediated. Now that's overreacting. We're going to go into the hyposensitivities, the underreacting. Your immune system isn't protecting you the way that it should. 
All right, so what is the difference between primary and secondary? This is easy. Primary are genetic defects that you have in your genes. Secondary, you acquire it via getting infected with a virus like HIV or, um, you know, getting treated with chemotherapy or radiation that helps deplete some of the function of your immune system or having cancer in um, your actual immune uh, cells or the precursors like in the bone marrow or something like that. So all that can lead to depression of the immune system so that it's not acting, you know, up to snuff, if you will, the way that it should be. Um, yeah, pretty good. Um, I said genetic, right? You guys remember me talking about the boy in the bubble? Um, that's SCID, the severe combined immunodeficiency. It's excellent SCID, but um, yeah, so that's what we were talking about. Um, you can be born with these things and they can be deadly. All right, chapter 18, our testing methods or diagnosis chapter. Give an example for phenotypic, immunologic, and genetic methods. So you know, maybe one of each or something. What is the difference between indirect and direct? And then what is the difference between specificity? And so you can see, I just shoved all of chapter 18 into this one slide Poor chapter 18. So <laughs> that's kind of what we did in the lecture too. My bad. All right. Phenotypic, immunologic, and genetic tests. Those are the three categories that any of your diagnostic tests are going to fall into typically. So if it is not related to antibodies or if it is not related to DNA, then it is phenotypic, okay? So phenotypic is just observing um, aspects about that organism reacting to chemicals or something like that. This includes our biochemical tests, like the plates that you guys grew your stuff on, um, ba based on the differences in how they grow or create different colors and things like that in reaction to what's in the media, that helps us determine differences between the bacteria, which we already know that helps us determine differences between the bacteria because that's exactly the point of our unknown project. This is what they do to determine. Now I know we're spreading this out over like the whole, the whole second half of the semester. And if you were to go to a hospital and they needed to do biochemical tests, they have those strips I told you some of you about this already, but it's the strips with all these different wells that do them all. Like each one is a biochemical test. It's super cool because it's just like one day of incubating instead of like the whole half of the semester that you guys are basically getting conned into, but that's okay. They're very expensive. So you get to do them individually and learn about the chemicals. Um. So anyways, biochemical tests. Yeah. Kirby Bauer. We already know about Kirby Bauer. We've seen it to death. Put our antibiotics on a lawn of bacteria, look for the zone of inhibition where it didn't grow. However, different bacteria might react differently or be more or less resistant to one antibiotic compared to another bacteria's response to that same antibiotic. And that can be predictable and can help us potentially identify differences. If we think it might be this or it might be this, oh, well, we know that this reacts differently to this antibiotic. Let's see which one it is based on that reaction. Phage typing has to deal with infecting um, your sample bacteria with a phage that is usually targeted for a specific bacteria. And if you see effects of the phage infection, which we call plaques, they're like little circles in it. Um, if you see that, that means that it did infect. So it has to be the organism that the phage targets. You have phages that only attack salmonella bacteria and your sample that you got from your patient happens to be, let's just say, E. coli. You mix the salmonella phage with the E. coli growth, it's not gonna have any effect on it. So that can help you tell the difference if you're suspecting something versus another thing. We also talked about imaging, not a whole lot, but I'm just saying that imaging is part of how we may diagnose something, especially you would know this, of course, for like tuberculosis, we would do a chest x-ray that can be used, stuff like that can be used to help identify or um, diagnose infections as well. MRIs, x-rays, you know, all that sort of stuff. Next, we have the immunologic tests. These are the ones dealing with antibody. 
Um, we also call these serology or serological tests because they're based from the patient's serum where you know the antibodies are, right? Um, tests that we talked about, well, let's start with ELISA first, since we did that in the lab. Now it should be familiar. Um, Enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. So we know that we're using the aspect of um, antigen antibody specificity to help us figure out and determine whether or not an organism or an antigen or antibody is there. Um, so yeah, all of these are basically based on that concept, but in different ways. In immunofluorescence, we have antibodies that are linked to a fluorescent molecule instead of the enzyme that causes things to change colors. Now it's just the molecule glows. We can use that by sorting through cells that did glow or didn't glow, for example. Next, we have um, Western blot. Western blot. This is getting super specific because now instead of a mixture of proteins like we have in serum, and we've been testing this whole mixture this whole time, let's go ahead and separate it out on the gel, just like we would with DNA. Small is going to go faster. And then we can transfer it onto this little membrane and then rinse it around in some solutions that tell us about the antigen or and or the antibody, depending on what you're looking for. Very, very specific. Um, very specific and is also um, very sensitive. So these are all pretty um, useful tests, especially for confirming certain diagnosis. Uh, we have the complement test too. It's just using that concept of complement reacting to antibody, um, causing the complement cascade to to see if something is present or not. I'm not going to test. I'm not going to test you about it. All right, the genetic tests that I would be aware of. Um, we really talked about the PCR probably the most, right? I mean, that's the one we definitely talk about the most. Polymerase chain reaction. It takes a little bit of DNA and just multiplies it out in many cycles using heat and cooling and everything and nucleotide using polymerase, adding on nucleotides, just doing that over and over again to get it to um, respond. It's very specific because you can have a primer because you have to start with a primer. It can't build off of nothing. So you have primers that are very specific for the start of the gene and the end of the gene that you might be interested in. The gene that is the sign of salmonella, let's say. Um, start of it and the end of it. And then basically what will happen is um, it'll like attach it if those things were able to stick on. But if they aren't able to stick on, they didn't match, that's not your organism. How do you know if they didn't match? It didn't multiply out. So you don't have any like increased amount of DNA in the end. The primers didn't match. That wasn't your thing that you thought it was. However, you run the cycle to look for salmonella but you added the salmonella primers in and your sample was salmonella and it did multiply out, that, that is salmonella. It can't be something else. If you want to confirm it, you can do one of the other tests. So that's the beauty of PCR and it only takes a few hours. Um, then we have hybridization, which this one here, I say fish, and this is um, fluorescent in situ hybridization, basically just using fluorescence to see if bits of DNA match with other bits of DNA. So the DNA, this gene is a sign of salmonella. You grab the sample on it, and if it sticks, it matched up with it. Like they're literally like pieces of DNA that have to match up, like the A's to the T's and the G's to the C's. This whole sequence, if that sequence matches up with this sequence and the fluorescence is attached to it, then it'll glow, but the others won't. So that's how you might tell that way. That's how that one would work. And then you can have a whole, whole big, plate with like 365 um, different versions, like just tons of them. And you want to know what the organism is. Um, you would could put it on that whole, whole big plate. And that's called a micro array. It's just a lot of it going on. And machines will an analyze it for you. All right. We have now uh, different kinds of tests, the indirect and the direct tests. Talk about this with Eliza. Indirect. This is where we're seeing if the patient has the antibody direct, which um, direct testing to see if the patient has the antigen, because I don't know if you guys remember, but if you have a well and you have a known antigen, that looks like a blue one. I'm sorry. There you go. You have a known antigen. 
Anyways, um, and you put the known thing in there. This is COVID, for example. Put COVID in there. Um, you put the patient's sera in there. You guys can remember this stuff. This is the antibody that's in the sera. The patient has the thing, so it sticks. Anyways, you do this again, and you add the secondary antibody that recognizes that the antibody is there. That second one has the enzyme. You add the liquid that changes color, changes, that's positive. You guys remember that, right? That's indirect. This is indirect. All right. The other version, you have a known antibody. You put it on the bottom. We've engineered it. It's on the bottom. We add the patient's serum or other sample. Um, it has the antigen in it. And then you add your secondary antibody. And it has the enzyme on it. And then you add your stuff in and it changes color and it's positive, right? So the second thing in there, always you have to know the first thing. The second thing is the unknown. Oh, and if you have to draw this out on your scratch paper, that helps me when I think about this stuff, but you do what you need to do. Um, anyways, um, the second thing that you add or that you're unsure about, the thing that you're unsure about, that is um, okay, your second thing. So if we are looking for the patient's antibody, that's the second thing. We're looking for the, if the patient has the antigen, that's the second thing. We added the known first. So you can see here, this is the one. Remember, this is the sandwich one. Because we have antibody, antigen, antibody. If we did the same thing on the other side, antigen, and then patient sera, because the second one is the unknown, comes from the patient, and then another antigen, this doesn't make any sense, no matter how many enzymes you add to that antigen. So that's not going to work. So that's why I draw it this way. Um, this is the sandwich here. It has to be antibody, antigen, antibody. If the second thing belongs to the patient, then we're looking for the antigen in this case. What is this called? Is this indirect or is it a direct? Hmm. It's direct because, like I said, remember, sandwiches go directly in your mouth. Okay, so that's that one. You can draw it out if you need to. If you don't, go on you. Um, specificity and sensitivity. Specificity, specifically, we're focusing on only a certain antibody or antigen. Only on that one thing. And in doing so, avoiding false positives. So we're focusing more towards tightening it down to only recognizing those things. Okay. In sensitivity, because you want to really catch it, focusing on detecting even the most minute quantities of whatever you're looking for. So you will avoid false negatives. So you'll catch a positive if it's there, even if it's just one. You will catch it. That's sensitivity. Specificity is saying that you will not catch Anything else, you'll only catch the things that you're looking at. Nothing's going to bind on some other rando thing and give you a false positive. You obviously want <laughs> most of your tests to be kind of both of these things, but some tests you might want to lean more to one side or the other when you have to make the choice, right? You just understand both of the concepts and you got it down. Um, there's another type of test, the Maldi-Toff, um, basically looking at parts, particles of a substance, like if it were um, a patient sample or something like that, looking at that substance and breaking it down to its parts and analyzing it based on those parts and how they react to breaking it down, essentially. They don't need to know the details of it, except that it allows them to see basically down to the atom of each of these. Um, yeah. Some uh, tests are gonna be pretty general would be very, um, very much not as specific or as sensitive as others, like a COVID home test. 
But then you might go to a doctor and they might do a confirmatory test that is probably both more specific and sensitive, um, like the PCR test. All right. That's it, guys. Um, yeah. Do you guys have any questions? Any specific questions? No, are... thank you. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I'm glad you're able to join us, Eric. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I went into Facebook. It was weird. Oh, oh, sorry. No worries. Thank you for this. Yeah. <laughs> um, I hope that helped at least some of you. This is like, I know one of the smallest groups that we've had for the review, but I also did give the slides out. So I get it. But um, if you guys have any questions, I know you don't right now. If you do, of course, you can email me and I will try to get back to you as soon as I can. Um, Monday people, your test is going to be Monday and Tuesday people, yours is going to be Tuesday. So happy studying. All right. If that's it. Yeah. We'll I had a quick question. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Are we supposed, so are we recommended to know the different MHs, like the MH one, two, three, four, just kind of what categories those are? Um, so the MHCs? Yeah. Yes. Only one and two. One and two. Okay. I mean, I know I feel that... like to me, those are like the functional, more functional ones, and those are more important. Right. Yeah. 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 So don't focus. Don't worry about the other ones. Just one and two. Okay. Anybody else? All right. I think that, um, yeah, I'm gonna call it a day. Um, let's try to go enjoy what we have left of our Saturday and I'll see you guys in the week. Bye. Mm -hmm.